Okay, so just give us a short introduction. Um, we're now starting the energy materials session and we will have two speakers now, Gayatri and Adva. So Gayatri, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes plus five minutes of questions. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, sorry, <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to present my work on high performance NAPF6 PUO TiO2 composite electrolyte for sodium ion batteries. And the outline it includes introduction, the synthesis of the electrolyte, uh, the physical and electrochemical characterization of the electrolyte and galvanostatic measurements. Then uh, I will start with a short introduction on uh, solid state batteries. And we all know that battery is energy storage device. Then solid state batteries are nothing but the storage, energy storage batteries uh, device which use a solid electrolyte with two electrodes. And they are serving as an alternative potential for the conventional lithium ion batteries. And this conventional lithium ion batteries use a liquid electrolyte with two electrodes. And we all know that these are uh, used in all the electronic devices what we are using now like laptops and mobiles, et cetera. Then why we, we are like looking forward towards uh, the solid state batteries? Because we can say that these conventional lithium ion batteries have, have reached their physical chemical limits and they also have a flaws in addition having an high ionic conductivity. Then what are the main flaws in, in these batteries are this liquid electrolyte, what we are using here is a flammable uh, electrolytes like ethylene carbonate or propylene carbonate, which can attain the fire and it leads to the blast. So, and in addition with that, there is a, a problem with the dendrite formation on the anode side. So in order to compensate all these limitations, we are looking towards the solid state batteries. Then now research is, most research is going on the solid state batteries and we can call it as a emerging trend for the second, uh, next generation batteries. Then what are the main advantages in using a solid state battery? If you take the main advantages, we can, we can tell in terms of safety. As we are using a solid non-flammable electrolytes, they are more safer than conventional lithium ion batteries. And they will work at high temperatures, even more than 300 degrees centigrade. And they are thermally stable and they can work in broader electrochemical window and they have high energy density. And there is no need for the separator because they itself uh, act as a separator and they will form a stable SCI. So there will be a long life cycles. So be because of all these advantages, then the solid state batteries are emerging as a next generation batteries. And in addition with the advantages, they have uh, drawbacks like a low ionic conductivity at room temperature. That is the main drawback in a solid state. That's why we, we didn't see that the solid state batteries are still not commercialized as a lithium ion batteries, uh, even though they have a lot of advantages. So main, advan main drawback is we don't have a perfect electrolyte materials uh, for the solid electrolyte, which have an ideal ionic conductivity. So because of these drawbacks, still th these are not reached to the level of commercialization, but there is a long way to go to get these solid electrolyte batteries in our hands, like maybe in, e e in the mobiles or laptops, et cetera. But vast research is going on in the companies like Tesla and Hyundai, Maybe we can see in near in far future the usage of the solid state batteries. And we know that in liquid electrolytes, the migration of ions will be through the electrolyte uh, towards uh, anode to cathode or cathode to anode during a charge and discharge cycle. But how the ion transportation will occur in a, a solid state uh, electrolytes? But usually the solid state electrolytes are uh, classified like two type, uh, like two, like ceramic electrolytes or polymer electrolytes. If you see in a uh, inorganic ceramic electrolyte, usually the ion migration will occur through the uh, defects in the crystal structure or due to mobility of the vacancies or interstitial ions. Here you can see, and we call these these defects are the Scotty defects or Frankel defects. And if you come to the polymer, if you see in the polymer electrolyte, usually 
the metal ions will coordinate with the lone pair of electrons which are present on the polar group of a, a particular polymers and uh, due to columbic interactions uh, the uh, between the polymer group and the metal ions there will be a dissociation between the anion and cation that means here the polymer itself will act as a solvent so when you apply electrical uh, field the lithium metal will flow from one point of the one point to another uh, point in the polymer segment or it will jump from one coordinate and point to or another coordination point in a polymer here the factors which affects the, the uh, ionic conductivity he is mainly depends upon the uh, concentration of the metal ions and and the mobility of the polymers here the poly mobility of the polymer chain we can see only in the amorphous state of a polymer that means when you heat the polymer above its melting point then only it will have a amorphous phase then only we can see the mobility of the ion that's why the polymer electrolyte it will show high ionic conductivity above its melting points so this is the main drawback in a, a solid state electrolytes a solid electrolyte so if you see the uh, uh, performance of a solid composite electrolyte because we working on a solid composite electrolyte it, that means here we it is the combination of a solid polymer electrolyte and inorganic ceramic electrolyte that means this one will have the properties of solid polymer and inorganic ceramic electrolytes that means they have high ionic conductivity and interfacial contact and electrochemical stability and strength in flexibility and there is a suppression in the lithium dendrite formation and thermal stability that's why they are these are considered as the uh, better uh, electrolyte in a solid and uh, solid state batteries that's why we we took solid composite electrolyte and here we'll see how we prepared the polymer electrolyte we we took pu as a polymer and nmpf6 as a sodium salt we took 16 is to 1 molar ratio of pu nmpf6 and we dissolved in acetonitrile solvent until we get the homogeneous solution and this solution we just casted on the teflon dish then after evaporation of the acetonitrile we can uh, get the membrane like this so if they, we get like to prepare a composite tio2 polymer electrolyte we first disperse the tio2 nanoparticles uh, in acetonitrile by uh, bath sonicator in 20 minutes then we'll see here in semi images of the uh, polymer electrolyte you can see that tio2 nanoparticles are well dispersed in the membrane and the performance of the battery usually depends upon the electrolyte so again this electrolyte we measure the ionic conductivity and transference number and ionic conductivity of an electrolyte it's it's it is measured through impedance measurement for a symmetric cell here we took sodium versus sodium symmetric cell and we measured the impedance the impedance it was like inversely related to the frequency so we measured the impedance from higher frequency to lower frequency if you see the impedance of the pvo nfpf6 at 50 degree centigrade and 80 degree centigrade you can see a little difference okay at lower at higher frequency we will usually obtain a bulk resistance in the middle frequency we will obtain the grain boundary resistance and in lower frequency we will get a sci resistance and charge transfer if you increase the temperature like above 60 degree centigrade the grain boundary resistance was disappear because as i explained uh, it the pvo melting point is 60 degree centigrade when you increase that above 60 degree centigrade the grain grain boundaries are disappear so if you compare the impedance of a pvo nfpf6 with tio2 and without tio2 here you can see the two uh, impedance spectra and when you add tio2 we observed that the re resistance was reduced by the factor of 3 so here we optimized the weight percentage of tio2 and we we took 2 4 6 8 and 10 weight percentages of tio2 and compared the ionic conductivity in each weight percent and we observed when you add four weight percentages of tio2 
there is an increase in the ionic conductivity when compared with the others. So we measured conductivity by using this formula. It is bulk conductivity is equal to thickness of the electrolyte and by bulk resistance and the area contact of electrolyte with the electrodes. And if you see the arrhenius plot of the PEO and NAPF6 with and without TiO2, usually without TiO2, here the, at 40 degrees centigrade, we observed that ionic conductivity was 0.013 milli Siemens per centimeter. And when you increase the temperature at 80 degrees centigrade, we observed that ionic conductivity was increased uh, uh, to 0.2 milli Siemens. And by adding TiO2 to this membrane, we observed that uh, Ionic conductivity was increased by the factor of two. That means it reaches 0.44 milli Siemens per centimeter. So you can see the morphology of the surface of all the membranes with different weight percentage. With 10 weight percentage, you can see that the particles were agglomerated. It's become, the surface becomes rough. So the transference number, it is the ratio of electric current, which is derived from the cation to the total electric current. We measured the transference number through Bruce Vincent method, like they, the Bruce and Vincent established this method for the ideal solid and polymer electrolyte. And the idea of this method is to measure the initial current and uh, steady state current, which passed through the cell during polarization. And here we measured the impedance before and after the polarization in order to avoid the SCI contribution. Okay, by using this formula, we measured the transference number of PEO, NAPF6 with TiO2 and without TiO2. With TiO2, we, we got 0.55 transference number. When you add four weight percentages of TiO2, the transference number was increased to 0.68. That means here we observed that by adding four weight percentage TiO2 to the PEO and NAPF6 solution, we increase the, uh, the ionic conductivity and transference number, both are increased. That means we increase the amorphous nature of the polymer and reduce the crystallinity. So this was again explained through the physical characterization of the membranes through XRD, DSC, and XPS. If you see the XRD, uh, spectrum here the true Bragg lines strong Bragg lines at 19 and 22 these are related to the crystallinity of the polymer that is PEO when you add TiO2 the intensity of the peak was reduced and it was shifted towards the uh, it is a little shifted so that means the when you add TiO2 or salt the crystallinity was reduced and here in DSC, the, the melting temperature was reduced from 72 to 56 when you add the NAPF6 salt. When you add TiO2, again, it reduced to 52. That means here, it's, it's, it, it was indicating that uh, amorphous nature was increased when you add TiO2 to the PEO NAPF6 solution. You can ask here, the PEO melting point was 60, but here it got 72 something because it have a different uh, polymer change. So it was showing 72. And in the XPS spectra, if you see oxygen, the intensity was reduced and it was shifted towards higher binding energy. That means it which indicates this lone pair of electrons, it was uh, bonded, uh, coordinated with the metal ions, more metal ions. That's why the intensity was reduced and it was shifted towards the higher binding energy. And this was also seen in COC bond. Here, the intensity was reduced when you add salt, and it was still reduced when you add four weight percentage of TiO2, which was like related to the amorphous nature. And here we can see that long-term stability of the polymer electrolyte was experimented by stripping and plating of the uh, symmetric cell by, uh, by giving intensity. Oh, okay, 0.1 milliampere per centimeter square for at 70 degrees centigrade. It was stable until few hours, and that means there is no formation of dendrites or no unstable ACI formation. Here you can see the galvanostatic measurements, and this one is the vol voltage profile of a liquid and PYNAPF6 with TiO2. It was more stable and the capacity was increased. Here the rate capability test of 
fever in FEF6. On adding TAO2, the rate uh, the capacity was increased from 85 to 110. That means when you increase the C rate, the distance between uh, the capacity distance was also increased. And here you can see one C rate uh, galvanostatic measurement. It's a 1.1 C at 70 degrees centigrade. It was a little reduction in the capacity, but it was more or less the stable until 100 cycles with uh, more or less the same columbic efficiency. And this is the liquid electrolyte. And I would like to thank my professor and my leader, group leader for uh, helping me doing all the work. And I, I, I would like to thank IVS team also to. Great. Thanks for your talk. It was uh, interesting. I really liked it. And uh, if anyone in the audience has questions, now is the time. I have a question. Can I? Go ahead. Um, when you showed the impedance uh, results, yeah. how you did the connection between the layer and the specific uh, semicircle? Um, sorry, this uh, one second. Uh, this one? Yeah, you said that the left one is uh, related to the grain boundaries. Um, this one? Yeah. Yeah, usually it's it was in the middle frequency. We saw that when you increase the uh, temperature, we didn't see like it was gradually reducing. So we concluded that this was related to grain boundaries because when you increase it automatically reduces. So we, we concluded that this part was related to the grain boundary. And we saw in many uh, articles, that they explained this above. Thank you. Thanks. More questions? If not, I would like to ask. Yes. Um, did you do charge discharge uh, cycles for your? Uh, uh... Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, these galvanostatic measurements. You can see the. All right, and uh, how many cycles uh, did you did you say that it was stable uh, for? I'm sorry, I yeah. can't probably. Can... Actually, I, I run it for like more than 100 cycle with one C rate, like 0.1 C. Uh, but here I, I also did the different rate capability test, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 1, 1, like different. So how it was changing with, but it was quite stable after all the uh, C rates. Okay, great. So if there are no more questions, uh, we can clear the floor for Adva. Thank you very much, Gayatri. Thank you. Hi, you see it? Yes, it's fine. Thank you. Go ahead. Can I try, uh, start or should I wait? You're free to start whenever you want. Okay, so I start. So hello everyone, my name is Adva. I'm from uh, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and I'm working in uh, Professor Leo Zedgar lab. Uh, we are focusing on solar cells based revoscite halides. Uh, and today I'm going to present you my uh, last project about study of selective contacts in inverted perevoscite solar cells. So uh, I decided to start with uh, a small anecdote because uh, I assume that uh, all of us are uh, a little bit tired after lunch. Um, so uh, some paper that uh, published uh, this April in scientific reports found that uh, they actually, um, the big question was what happened when people want to install uh, solar cells in the roof? What influenced them to do it? So, it is the political opinion, they found it not. It is the cost of the electricity, they found also, not the question, not the answer. Is it the global warming that concern us all? Also not the answer. So what happened? What influence about us to install a solar panel on our roof? They found that if our neighbor have solar cells installed on their roof, 
it is most likely that we install them as well. So it's really nice to, to see it, uh, uh, how they checked it. Uh, they actually checked it in Fresno, in California, in the USA. And you can see how the panels are focusing in one region. And if you go broader, you can see it. So I think it's nice uh, fact. And let's move to my project. So in the first, uh, I, I showed you that uh, I'm working on perovskite solar cells. So I start with a short introduction about what is perovskite and what is solar cells and how it's work. So in our uh, lab, we are working with perovskite uh, based halides perovskite with the general formula of ABX3, when A is organic or inorganic cation that we can find in the center. We have B, which is divalent cation. Uh, generally, it's a lead cation and halide cation, uh, which can be uh, chloride, iodide, or bromide. So this is the general formula and the basic uh, structure. What is solar cells? From, from the left, you can see inverted structure uh, solar cells, uh, which I focused in my project. So we have the uh, glass. Above it, we have cover of uh, ITO, which is the anode. Above it, we have whole transport layer, which called also HTL. Above it, the perovskite layer. Above it, the ETL, which is the electron transport layer. And finally, we are evaporating uh, metal contact. Uh, which in my case is silver. So if we jump to the energy diagram, we can see the level, uh, the energy level of the materials that I show you here. And when the sun hits the perovskite layer, we have the association process of the hole and the electron. When the electron goes to the conduction band and the holes go to the valence band. According to the basic of thermodynamically, the electron Go, goes to uh, decrease in the energy and the holes go up in energy. Uh, so this is how we ac can extract voltage from our solar cells. In my specific uh, solar cell that I showed you uh, just a minute, uh, this is the specific uh, layers that I used. The ITO as the anode, the pilot PSS as HTL, uh, MIPBI3 as, as the perovskite layer, PCBM will be the electron transport layer and above it, the silver contact uh, metal. Uh, in this project, I focused on three different uh, architecture, the full device, the HTL free and ETL free devices. So what is HTL free and ETL free devices? HTL free devices is from the left. You can see that I actually remove the, this layer. What happens is the now the holes uh, need jump directly to the anode. In ETL free device is the other case when I remove the ETL and then the electron goes directly to the cathode, to the silver. So this is the difference between uh, the, two, the two of them. And what are the properties of those materials and why you are, we are using it? So ETL is suitable energy level alignment with the perovskite active layer. It has obviously high electron mobility of electron extraction. And uh, one most, uh, is another in, uh, advantage is stable for a uh, long term stability. In the other end, we have the HDL, which is increase the selectivity of the contact and reduce recombination. Like the ETL, it has a high hole mobility and it increases the internal quantum efficiency. So just a, a brief uh, focusing of what, what I will show you today. So this is the full structure with all of the layers, the ETL free without the ETL and the HTL free without the HTL. So let's go to my motivation, why actually I decided to do this project. So elimination of those layers can uh, 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 give us a lot of advantages such as avoiding oxidation, uh, it gives us a much simpler fabrication process and reducing the cost because those materials are very, very expensive related to another material in our solar cells. Uh, the second motivation was to understand the P, and the P or the N type behavior of the perovskite layer, since we know that he can, it can uh, uh, behave uh, in different ways. And also investigation of the electron transport and the whole transport layer, uh, understand it uh, uh, mechanically and physically and to see how it affects our solar cells. 
So the adjustment that I need to do in my project is energy level. Like we saw before, there is very big influence about the energy levels in our solar cells. I need that the charges will effectively collected and effectively injected. So it's very, very interesting to see about the energy level of our solar cells. Uh, also to see how the electronic or the whole properties of the materials affect our solar cells and uh, solvent engineering. I need to be sure that if, when I put uh, another layer on each other, uh, since I do it in a spin coating, it's not dissolved the bottom layer. So I will start with my results with the optical characterization. So the first measurement we did is the regular absorbance measurement of the three architecture. And we saw that we have a little, really, really diff, uh, similar behavior for them. And this is because the main layer that affects in this absorbance is the perovskite layer, uh, which is the same for uh, three architecture. The next uh, measurement that we did is the cathode luminescence. In cathode luminescence, we can see the luminescence from all of the layers of the cells because we do it in electron beam that penetrated all the structure until the end, until the anode. So we can see a little bit uh, a blue shift of the HTL3 device. And this uh, happened uh, accordingly to perceivation defect in the perovskite layer by a uh, lead iodide. And if we can see here from the right, the uh, PA lifetime, we can see that we got the shortest time for HTL3 device, uh, which uh, conclude us that uh, this is a, a radiative recombination instead of uh, MAPBI3 and ETL3 that show a relatively high uh, PL lifetime. Uh, another interesting point, uh, we know from uh, uh, previously reported that the substrate has big influence about our uh, crystallization process. We can see that when we use the uh, P.PSS, which is the, uh, our HTL, and here it's without, there is a big, very big influence about the crystallization. The grain size are much bigger, and also we can here uh, see some uh, pinholes that we can see here. So it's very influenced about solar cells and about the crystallization of the upper layer. So it's interesting to see it like this. Uh, the next characterization, like I said to you before, uh, in our uh, lab we are focusing in uh, devices, full device, and therefore we did a device, of course. And uh, from the left, we can see a JV curve, which is uh, actually very basic curve. Uh, we can see from it the current density in Y axis. In X axis, we can see the voltage of our solar cells. Uh, we can find uh, the efficiency and learn how our solar cells work, how about uh, what is the defect uh, in, in, in it. So from the right, we can see the VOC and the JSC. We can see that uh, the JSC remains uh, relatively similar for all the architectures, so the current uh, remains the same, but we have some VOC loses. So uh, after it, I will show you what happened in VOC loses, but let's see first the uh, efficiency. Standard. Efficiency is actually the sum. Can you mute? Um, can, it's the sum of the VOC and the JSC. So uh, we can see that, uh, of course, we have uh, for the full device the biggest uh, efficiency and the HTL3 show the lowest efficiency. So what are VOC loses and how it occurs in our solar cells? Uh, the first uh, reason is relatively low photocurrent. Uh, in this case, the generated electron hole may be not effective collected and it's logical in our solar cells because we don't have one of the layers. The second reason can be reverse saturation current. Uh, this is due to high recombination rate in the perovskite layer. And the third reason can be defect in the perovskite layer. Like I showed you before, we have some pinholes and some uh, defects that can affect our VOC loses. Uh, we did also a measurement under dark and other uh, illumination. So from the right is the regular measurement that I showed you before. And from the left, we can see the measurement under dark. In this case, we can see that for the HTL3, we have a much uh, higher current leakage instead of the uh, full device. And this is also logical since we don't have the, H the HTL, sorry. 
And the last characterization uh, that I show you today is the EQE, external quantum efficiency. Uh, in this uh, method, I want you to uh, focus on three different range, uh, which is the yellow one, the ETL range, the red one is the perovskite range, and the green one, which is the HTL range. So we can see a difference between the three of them. And I want to focus on the green range because it's uh, much uh, interesting. So we can see that for the HTL3 device, there are big decrease uh, since uh, 600 nanometers uh, when the full device is uh, reached until uh, actually the band gap of the material. So the uh, photons collective much efficiently for the full device. So conclusion for uh, this project and what we found so we, we fabricate solar cell without ETL or HTL and it's still working, so it's very nice. Uh, when, when we're removing the HTL, we found that it's crucial for the device and it harmed the decay time and the privy properties uh, decreased significantly. And we got that the current uh, stay very similar for three different architecture. And therefore uh, we assume that the losses are in the VOC. So I want to thank everyone for my group. Thank you to Professor Leo Zedgar, uh, to my group members, and thank you also for the IVS for the opportunity to, to do this presentation. Okay, great talk. You even finished early, but still managed to get your point across. So if there are any questions from the audience, please go ahead. All right, I would like to start with uh, maybe a bit more basic question. I'm not really from the field, but uh, are the perovskite uh, layers supposed to work in tandem with silicon solar cells in the end, or are they supposed to be standalone? Uh, they can be uh, together with silicon uh, in the device, but in our lab, we are doing uh, only the perovskite layer. Uh, it actually will be very interesting to combine with, between them and to, to get higher efficiency. But uh, um, in our lab, we are not doing this. We, are, we can uh, do tandem uh, actually with different perovskites because we can create different uh, band gaps with only the perovskites. So it's actually also possible. Great. I would have thought that uh, maybe the silicon layer could act as either an HDL or ETL, depending on the case, which could be interesting as yes, well. Yes, it can be. You're right. Okay, if anyone wants to ask any questions, go ahead. If not, thank you very much, Adva, for your talk. And uh, we have another break now, and we will meet for the Flash Talk session. So, see you soon. Bye for now.